In the spirit of WrestleMania, MotoGP, let the cruiserweight steal the show. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Hey folks, welcome to episode 295 of the Motorsport 101 podcast. I'm your friendly neighbor, host Ray Harrison, and uh, MotoGP is back, everybody! Yeah! Woo! And it was awesome! Oh, yeah! <laughs> oh, that, that I, 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 even though it was kind of back last week, but we're catching up. It's kind of strange, but um, yeah. Um, long story short, in case you didn't hear last week's episode... We did Formula One in Bahrain first and foremost and made that the entire show. And we thought it would be cooler and a little bit easier uh, to, to, from a discussion standpoint to put both MotoGP races together into one big block for this separate episode. So, you know, it's all neat and packaged and stuff. So, yeah, that's the plan for this one. Don't worry, we'll be back on something a bit more normal next week when we talk about Formula E and preview IndyCar. So that'll be fun. But in I the mean, meantime... Formula E is also having a double header. <laughs> <laughs> but they're at we'll the figure- same venue for that double header. We'll f- we'll they were figure the same it venue out for this double header. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but weren't they all in like the same weekend? That is something true. like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, look, look. We made it sound more confusing than it actually is because that's what we do on this show. But hey, we'll figure it out next week. Just keep an eye on the social media for that. We've missed anyway this week, as always. RJ O'Connell, hello, sir. Ah, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. It's gonna be a good one. Um, we have tweaked some things around a bit. We're we're gonna be we're gonna be more focused on the stories that happened this weekend. Because look, we could just be like the three hundred thousandth different race review podcast. There are tons of those out there. You you don't need to come to us for that. You come to us for the different stuff, like us breaking down what happened in the, in the race. Talk about the stories, our hot takes, our um, irreverent discussions that may or may not our pers- may involve our personal lives. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'll hit the button. I'll hit the button. <laughs> King, King is currently threatening all of our lives and the lives of our supporters. But yeah, if we hit the like- button early, we're not going to be able to dump all that Snapple, snapple in the harbor. <laughs> oh. Are you trying to open old 2017 wounds of mine here, RJ? Is that it? Like, back when I may or may not have had a Snapple addiction? It was a tough time in my life. The 2017 you know? wounds for you, uh, wounds from the 1770s for your country. <laughs> Are you just taking advantage of the fact that I'm the only Brit on this show now? Is that it? Uh, like, this is just... <laughs> also, also... Yes. This has come up recently, I think on social media, but... Uh, as a throwback to a very, very old episode, someone oh, no. mentioned Jennifer Bex to me and how Jennifer Bex is still dating Adrian Satil. <laughs> now, why would you bring that up, King? You know, just, um... just as a throwback to an older episode. <laughs> It, 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 it was a di- it, 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 it was a different time. We were into the U.S. Women's National Team. You know, we we had whoa, guys. Whoa. Were <laughs> were <laughs> what's this, what's this past tense um, kind of garbage? We we, and we this hide. is the part where I go for a long enthusiastic walk in the park away from all of my co-hosts. <laughs> yeah, we had we had someone with a with a with a Laura Trot restraining order on. We had a guy that liked anime girls. It was a tough time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's. It's, it's it's like that scene in Jurassic Park two when Jeff Goldblum is looking at the ever growing mound of dinosaur. Anyway, uh, King, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Hoping no one actually goes back to the into the archive and listens to those episodes. <laughs> you do realize that several people in this Discord already have. Mm. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> what are we, we going to get? Uh, the cancelled? Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, do not go back and listen to all of our episodes at motorsport101.com or wherever no. you find your favorite podcasts. No, no, no. Um, apparently there was another Englishman on there at some point. Apparently we hijacked him. He's uh, he's, he's been kidnapped by a by a lanky man in, in the background who's currently shaking his head at all of us disapprovingly um, like a disappointed dad even though he's the youngest out of all four of us on this show because that totally makes sense Cam Buckley, how you doing sir? 
due to the events of the last five minutes, I have nothing else to say. Let's get on with the show. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it! You know, I, I I can't argue with that logic. I really can't, unfortunately. Um, Cam, you signed up for this. That's uh, what I would say in response. I signed up for this. I was a Lamar special one-time appearance. And y'all kidnapped me. <laughs> Yes, enjoy the raw meat. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that got to. We've I, I got love, I love how your internet connection took issue with that comment. <laughs> yeah, like Sky Broadband was like, we can't have this. <laughs> Very oh, briefly, Un- unfortunately, like, th- unfortunately, I heard it, and it is gonna be in the recording. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> so, so, so Cause... before we're completely incriminated, uh, what are we talking about today? <laughs> Um, we are yeah, talking got... about the two MotoGP races in Qatar, yeah, round one he... and round two, and uh, they were fun. Oh, very great, fun, good fun, good, very good, good fun. fun. Yeah, this was like this was an incre- this was a fantastic pair of weekends. Well, I'd say the Doha weekend in weekend two even better than the the opening weekend in general. I mean, it's it was. Look, we, we gush about MotoGP on this show, and for good reason. Like, we all love it. You, you rarely get a bad MotoGP weekend, ever. In fact, like, we we are startled when, like, a MotoGP weekend isn't, like, a 7 out of 10. So, like, this yeah, like, was... A truly a bad MotoGP we- weekend is, like, an excellent weekend for 90% of other racing series. Pretty much. So, uh, yeah, if you're not into bikes yet, start watching. I mean, like, the fact that people have tweeted me saying, Dre, I want to get into bikes this season, I say, do it. You will not be disappointed. Um, yeah, there is something for everybody here. And this week, like, especially the Doha weekend, is just what this past weekend we just had, there really was something for everybody. We had a uh, ridiculous high speed, argy bargy, a uh, shock Yamaha victory, a brilliant intense dogfight in Moto2, and a man winning a race from the pit lane. No, really, this happened. Um, we'll break down all of those details and have some fun with it a little bit later on. But uh, places you can find us in the meantime, just to get the general housekeeping out of the way, we're on youtube.com forward slash motorsport 101. If you're watching us on YouTube, Hi, nice to see you. Um, subscribe, uh, hit the bell if you haven't already. You can get notifications on when new content drops. Um, again, our Twitter handles are also on the screen. You can follow the podcast at motorsport underscore 101. Uh, if you're not listening to us on live video, they're at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, at Ryan Eric King, and at CBuckley917. We're on Facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. We're on Instagram at motorsport101pod for updates on our content there as well. Um, and if you really, really like us, you can back us financially on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash motorsport101. $5 gets you early access to all of the audio versions of our shows. You can upgrade to 10 bucks for the video versions of all those shows as well, and gain access to the supporters club of our Discord server where you can listen to these episodes live as they're being recorded. Uh, you can find all those details and a whole lot more on our website, motorsport101.com. Whew. So... Without further ado, uh, and after this quick musical interlude, we'll be back to talk about MotoGP's weekends in Qatar and Doha. It totally isn't confusing. At all. <laughs> MotoGP, again, we had, again, as mentioned, we had two races. One last week, one this past weekend. The first one was the Grand Prix of Qatar. The second one was the Grand Prix of Doha, because they've got to name the second race in a doubleheader something different. Um, they'll be running jokes about this all through the season, no doubt about that. Um, hopefully... Yeah, hopefully not so much this year. Hopefully less covid type restrictions, but we'll have to wait and see. Anyway, just took some quick notes about what happened in both races. Maverick Vinyard has won race one. He had a trademark comeback through the field like he's done before many occasions. He had uh, Johan Zarco and Francisco Bagnaia for company for the majority of that one. We had Johan Mir pull off one of his uh, almost typical uh, midfield to front of the pack um, comebacks through the field. But unfortunately, turns out the Raiden World Champion is a bit fuming, fumbled at the final corner and had both Ducatis blow past him to go from second to fourth in the space of about half a second. Poor fella. Um, some other standout notables. Alicia Spagaro there in seventh for Aprilia uh, on the first weekend back after Fausto Grassini's passing, which was a nice touch. We had Digier on the podium in the Moto2 race as well. That was nice. 
Um, very emotional podium, a lot of tears, a lot of heavy hearts in that paddock, but it was nice to see. Um, and we had, um, for, I think, one of the underappreciated performances of the weekend, Anea Bastianini running 10th on last year's Ducati in his first race for Avintia. Very impressive indeed. One of the big hitters that had a pretty bad weekend, Frankie Morbidelli, unfortunately. Um, quick note on that, they, they discovered that his whole shot device was stuck on while still on the grid. And by the time they discovered it, it was too late and they couldn't fix it in time. So they had to basically tell Frankie, nurse it. And uh, Frankie, after the race, said, well, it's either I ride a second the lap slower or I crash. Um, thankfully, he took the first option, uh, unfortunately. Um, mm. Not great at all. Uh, race two, Fabio Quadraro winning from Johan Zarco again in second. And a bit of a surprise in third, Jorge Martin. In one, we'll talk about him in a bit more detail in just a second, in just his second career race. We had some big flashpoints in it. We'll, again, more detail in a minute. Johan Mir and Jack Miller, probably the biggest um, highlights of that race. And a, a, a bit of a tangle, two of them, that got a very dicey indeed on that one. Uh, Maverick falling through the field and then trying to come back through it again. Not so successful on the second attempt. Uh, Alicia Spagaro threatened the podium again, didn't quite put it off this time round, and yeah, race two wasn't special for one big reason, it was the closest top 10 and top 15 in the history of MotoGP, just 5.3 seconds separating first through 10th, and 8.9 covering all 15 points paying positions. Um, absolutely ridiculous. For perspective, Valentino Rossi was 9 seconds off the win, didn't score a point because he was in 16th place. Crazy. Not a good weekend in that second weekend for the doctor. Oof. Yeah, qualified 21st. His worst ever qualifying position in his 25-year Grand Prix career. Um, the last time he started that far back in Qatar, he was sweeping his side of the grid back in 06. Um, oh. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> that old wound. Oh, I mean, let's, let's get into some of the bigger some key storylines of the weekend and the first one I want to get into is well there's no ifs and buts around it we were we were we were on the fence about Yamaha in our season preview and they ended up taking both wins one for each of their riders um both had pretty darn good pairs of weekends overall they're now second and third in the championship early doors and I'm going to come to you on this one first Cam I mean how big a W was this for Yamaha to take the first two races this weekend? Was this a was this a big win for Yamaha? Or was it more a loss for the, the team we normally associate with their success, and that's and that's Ducati? I think it's equal parts both. I think Yamaha, I think Yamaha themselves were a little bit kind of unknown with where their bike was. They mm. know that their bike strength is get out. Get out in the lead and just run because they really can't fight through the pack unless they're, it becomes a tire management race, uh, nor can their two riders. And we'll touch on that with Vinales a little bit later. Mm. Vinales got to the front in race one after it was a Ducati shutout early on. They were running one, two, three, four. And I'd like to touch on the definition of insanity for one moment. <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. Yeah. The Ducati had unreal straight line speed. Perhaps more than any other year. Mm -hmm. They were going by anything with two wheels, anything with four wheels, even the trains. <laughs> <laughs> but just like every other year... It doesn't turn. It, 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 every year, Ducati shows up with the same problem, and it just doesn't work. And now they've got a couple of riders who can... They can brute force through it in terms of raw speed. We saw mm. Pecco put it on pole with an emphatic pole position. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, that was wonderful. But instead of being unable to turn and it affecting their lap time, or at least early on in the race... They're just destroying their tires now. We got halfway through the race and all the Ducatis dropped like a stone. Yeah. yeah. Jorge Martin was the first one to fall. Although, I, I, even still, in that first race, the Cutter Grand Prix, 
the Qatar Grand Prix. Uh, Qatar, Qatar, not Qatar. Or is it Qatar? Not Qatar. I don't know. Anyway, that first race, Jorge <laughs> Martin had the perfect start. Mm. The greatest. One and of that the was about as good seen. as it got. For, it, it was as good as it got for him that whole race weekend. But it got better the next weekend. Mm. That really yeah, impressed. Me. Uh, more on that in a couple minutes, but uh, yeah, I think to take a win here is really impressive for Yamaha. In the past, this has not been one of their tracks. Um, it's very much equal parts of power and cornering track. Mm. The bigger concern for me is that they're not that great over. It's it's kind of the opposite of what we figured they would be. They're not that great over one lap. But they're very good, at least the work spikes were, uh, in terms of race pace, maintaining their tires and then attacking at the end. Yeah, that's 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 the impression that I got. I mean, even Yamaha's riders themselves are not 100% sure. I mean, Kotawaro said after the win, yeah, they're likely to be won. We have no idea if that Qatar speed will be transferable to other tracks like Portimao next weekend. They, they, they're they still not 100% last sure where year they're at. It sounds mm. like a repeat of what happened last year. We opened last year. We thought Quadro was going to have the easiest championship run imaginable after Marquez went down. <laughs> it didn't play out that way. Yeah, I, I, I distinctly remember me sat down with my old buddy Lewis on the phone after that first pair of weekends in her ref, and we were sitting there thinking, oh God, what the problem? What, what if what if Quattararo dominates the whole season like he did those first two rounds? And we were sitting there just thinking, oh God, how's the fans going to take it? Are they going to turn on him? And we got anything but <laughs> in the end. One of the most um, hectic seasons I think I've ever seen in all my years of watching yeah. motorsport, but... I think Yamaha has reason to be happy. They won two races. They got a real good uh, haul of points for both of their factory riders. On the mm. other hand, Valentino, story of two weekends. First weekend, he looked like a new man. Put it on the front row. Didn't go so great in the race. Got bullied a little bit by one uh, Lord Bender. Mm. Second weekend, nothing. Nowhere. He he Absolutely looked his he, he looked his age more than I think he has up to this point in MotoGP. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember like distinctively. I think it was after qualifying on Saturday that I saw him talk to the media on that second weekend in qualifying. Where he straight up said to the world's press, "I'm not fast enough. I've never." In 25 okay. years, <laughs> <laughs> of Valentino Rossi ever come around and openly admit, guys, I'm not fast enough, and I have no idea where it's going to come from. Um, still early days. I mean, the end of the day, this it's still early days, and you know that yeah. qualifying in the first weekend when he put it on fourth is his best ever lap of the track. We all thought, yeah. oh my god, 42 year old Valentino still got it, and then he ended up being just. Not, um, in the end, yeah. and uh, um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's the less it's a said about Frankie Yamaha's. Morbidelli. Morbidelli had a not so good weekend in the in the second race, where he was just kind of nowhere in the first race with that whole with that whole shot device problem. If you don't know what that does, it lowers the bike, uh, to get a better start. It it effectively mm. kind of cut it splits the frame in half, lowers the bike. Well, that was stuck on for the whole race, so he could barely lean the bike. Yeah, it was like riding in the rain, basically. Um, just yeah. yeah, no lean and just you know, compromised entry on everything. wasn't pretty at all. Um, just, like, it's it's gonna talk about Chicago. It was just right, not good. No, yeah, yeah. not good. Yeah. Uh, whew. I mean, overall, though, as as Cam alluded to, I mean, overall, Yamaha, I think, will gladly take that. They, they have two two very, very strong wins. You know, again... To circle like, back to Ducati uh, mm. quickly. Yikes. <sighs> Just yikes. I mean, you've dominated this race about as well as you could have in the face of Mark Marquez the last few times we've run here. Mm. Last two winners, uh, last two winning performances with Andre Davizio. So actually more, wasn't it? 
Yeah, had a couple Maybe. with him. It was just a couple with him, because I think Yamaha had to add a few wins in between as well, because they've had Rossi and Lorenzo get wins, like 2015, for yeah. example. So, like, like Yamaha... like It's not like Yamaha have been terrible here throughout the years. They've had a handful of wins no, themselves the, on this one as in, well. In but. the Davi v. Marquez era, this was always a, sta- a, a staple of Ducati season. And, yeah. well, they looked really good. Right up until the point where they didn't. And to circle <laughs> to our next point. Johan Zarco. He went really goddamn fast in one of our sessions in the first weekend. Yeah, your boy. It... Back, in, back in the headlines. <laughs> My boy. <laughs> boy in Number very five. large quotes. <laughs> now, um, if you think... Uh, over 200 miles per hour is pretty fast on, well, anything. Think, well, over 220 is pretty fast for a car, let alone a bike. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and Zarco went a startling 225.2 miles per hour. For the rest of the world, that is 362.4 kilometers per hour. That's quick. <laughs> that, he, he, like, that all-time top speed record went down three times in the space of that first weekend in Qatar. Um, they were just getting over 220, I think, the second time. I think it was Martin that broke it, then I think Zarko broke it again that same day, and then, bang, he missed his breaking point by 20 metres by the time he got to the end of the straight. But it was the was perfect say, that, that's not even, of a... Keep in mind, the speed trap is not actually where the bikes hit top speed. I think it's about halfway down no. the straight. So he was... We have reason to believe he hit 230 miles per hour on a motorcycle. S- something ludicrous like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the straight goes on for another 400 meters before you're hitting the brakes. Um, yeah, the, the official speed gun is at the start finish line. Um, and if you want, if you know the Qatar as a track, it's about 60% of the way down the straight. So, yeah, it's it was a lengthy one. To put that into some perspective, because, you know, numbers are numbers... To, I'll convert it into a more telling stat. Uh, 225 miles an hour is pretty much 100 meters per second. You're doing you're doing an a 100 meters sprint every second. Yes, that is a football pitch a second. <laughs> it's you saying Formula Volkswagen One cars record at nine and a half times the speed. Formula One cars haven't gone that fast since the new regulations in 2017. Le Mans mm-hmm. prototypes, which race at Le Mans, it's in the name, uh, haven't gone that fast since the end of the days of the big five and a half liter diesel engines. Right. It's, it's fast. It's, it's lo- and, you, and you're talking about doing this on a 300 plus horsepower, 160 kilo motorcycle. That is yeah. like, it, it's, it's one thing when you're doing it in a closed cockpit. You're, it's another thing when you're head down on a on a vehicle that's got something close to you're, 2000 you're open to the elements. per ton. Yeah, you're like open to the elements at t- and, a, and you're on a machine that can do that's got 2000 brake horsepower per ton basically or almost 2000 brake it's, horsepower uh, per ton. That is oh my God. unbelievably fast. It, it is 5 miles an hour more than what the official record was at the time. If you include the unofficial times that we've seen in testing sessions, it blitzed anything from there. It is probably the highest top speed ever seen in a sanctioned Grand Prix on two wheels. Utterly yep. ridiculous. Um, for some, for a little bit of perspective, uh, Valentino Rossi's, uh, his first MotoGP bike, the all-conquering Honda NSR 500 two-stroke, That top speed was about 197 miles per hour. Mm. We are the better part of 30 miles per hour clear. <laughs> and it's it's, it's oh it's my crazy. god! Like like Matt Oxley wrote a fantastic piece about this on in on in Motorsport magazine. I do have, I do recommend checking that out. I don't, I don't normally plug the opposition here, but it was some good stuff. And just talking about how when we first started in Grand Prix racing, the bikes are now going almost twice as fast as they were then, and with six and a half times the power output. It is scary, the amount of power these bikes have. And there was a great quote about this from Valentino Rossi, who said, 
Quote, about the danger, for me, anything more than 3.30, which is 2.05 in uh, in uh, Queen's English, is very dangerous. So 360 is an incredible number. Uh, he said, I think motorsport fans are very excited by this number because it's impressive. But for sure, this speed is dangerous. Now, I wanted to link back those two points together because that same piece talks a lot about the safety elements of it. And look, there's no getting around it. Even if you see the clip of Zarco hitting that speed... He goes about 120 meters deep into the gravel trap at the end of turn one because he missed his braking zone by that much. I don't think even Zarco realized how fast he was going when he leans up and hits the brakes. Um, is there I mean, something it, it to be sent? Yeah, no. Yeah. It, it sent the whole motorsport world. I mean, I threw the uh, I threw the no- the news of that in uh, Jimmy Broadbent's Discord, <laughs> and it kind of sent everyone into a state of shock. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just not something you imagine being possible on on a two wheel machine, and yet that is that that's the limit that has now been broken. To put into context, and, and, and yeah. just from my own perspective, like I know Cam is like the only one of us that like rides a motorcycle, but I was th- I was looking at Zarco speeds, and I was looking at the, some of the speeds of Moto Three races. That's like what. A Moto three bike gets up to around like two hundred twenty five, two hundred thirty clicks. Yeah, yeah. most and of the time. That's that's speed that are like terrifying for a layperson riding on a road on a motorcycle <laughs> on a road. Like that's dangerous speed. Like, road, I bike, could, I, road bikes don't do that. Road <laughs> bikes have actually been regulated so that they can't do that. Yeah, to go one hundred and thirty um, clicks above that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I mean, to put it in perspective for me, um, obviously there were major circumstances as to why we no longer go to Suzuka as a MotoGP track. Of yeah. course. Um, the bikes were considered too fast for that track then. And of course we lost one of the star, the up and coming stars of that era, mm. Fujiro Kato, to a crash going through 130R. The bikes had uh, similar engine rules, but had only about 220 horsepower then. Yeah. Now, we are now, we can, we have good reason to believe Ducati is above that by about 100. That they're <laughs> over 320 horsepower. Yeah. And think about some of the other tracks that are on the MotoGP calendar, because, like, we were talking about this pre show. Like, yeah, Doha, Doha's got. A lot of runoff. Saxon ring, not so much. Yeah, there's no places where you can hit 225 miles per hour at the Saxon ring. But in general, it's just getting quick. So where you got to yeah. wonder, like, are these bikes getting too fast for the uh, for the for the places that they race upon? Well, if I... something happens on a motorcycle and you are traveling 225 miles per hour, you know, bad things happen. <laughs> Bad, terrible, bad terrible things, things happen, happen. and it, it, it's what you need to look at is at a certain speed, they're going to run, they're going to slide to the end of the gravel trap. Mm. At a certain speed, eventually you're going to be going fast enough. If you go down, you're going to end up in a wall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, King, what do you make of this? Because I know you've seen it with cars and bikes all the time now, and... You know, we've seen tracks recently. We had the same conversation about Austria last year. We had a couple of big near misses in that one. We've talked about Catalonia in the past, obviously with the passing of Louis Salom half a decade ago. And, you know, turn 12 being the the problematic corner on that circuit. I mean, is there such a thing as too fast of this sport? Because these, these bikes are getting faster and faster and faster year on year. And they're not slowing down anytime soon. Uh... Yeah, because with with cars, you could always make the argument where you could make cars safer. You can't really make a motorcycle safer at this point. Like, no, no. <laughs> the best thing you can do on a motorcycle is come off of the bike and slide. Hopefully, in a place where you're just a little bruised up, you get up, you walk back. And in certain situations, if you go down at speed. And you don't have enough runoff. There's nothing you can do designing the bikes or the the race suits that they use, which are phenomenally advanced. 
uh, there's a limit that there's a limit outside of what can be done to the tracks to make MotoGP safer. And mm. yeah, and we're going to be hitting the real limit at some of the places MotoGP goes to. And when you're going 220 plus and something goes wrong, it's going to be hard to scrub off enough speed to safely get off the bike. Uh, and some right. of the places that MotoGP could be going to, like, you know, the, the rumors that, you know, for like MotoGP could be returning to Spa and like, oh, my God. The potential for things also keeps to go like, wrong <laughs> is oh, so Qatar high. also isn't... Qatar isn't one of those... Tr- it, it is fast by MotoGP standards. It's of not course. the fastest. Yeah. No. Like, there's a few quicker ones out there still, but even so, I mean... Spa, again, there's a couple of places on that track where there is virtually no runoff. And, uh... Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I'm just thinking the run up... A Rouge and Radion down the Camel. Yeah. That's a lot of straight for the Ducatis and the Hondas to amass quite a lot of speed. Yeah, and you'd be coming out of that at over 100 comfortably, and then you've got a massive run down the Camel straight. I mean, yeah, like, it's, it's alarming. And I'm glad that, you know, we can have this conversation about safety because, yeah, the speed is very thrilling. And, of course, to us... And let's be honest, we're all we're all nerds for this sort of thing. And as Cam's pointed out into the Jim Cord's reaction, like they, they, it's hard to wrap your head around that sort of performance. And like I, I, I marvel at this tech. I mean, I grew up like late later parts of the eight, late nineties where they were just clipping two hundred miles an hour, and now they're doing that at half the calendar. And, you know, in some places they're getting over 210 miles an hour. Mugello is later on in the year. That'll be another track where I remember the freeway we got last year between Dovi, Petrux, and Marquez. They were all doing 215 miles an hour over that bump. You know, free wide at that speed, which is just unbelievable stuff. It makes for fantastic photos and highlights, but uh, it doesn't half stop but make you think. But... um, yeah, that's one to that's one that's one to to soak in for a bit. Now, <laughs> there is there is some pros to this as well because we also had both Ducatis on pole, so or two Ducatis of the four, we should say that we mainly associate with them on pole over the course of the weekend. The first one, um, in the Qatar weekend, Francisco Bagnaia set the fastest ever lap of the the Los Angeles International Circuit. I told you. I told you on the season preview, I believe in him. That lap was nuts. King, can it we was mute him? Nuts. <laughs> like two weeks in a row, he's made he's he's come in full smug bastard mode because he was talking he was on the plus side of the Banyaya amendment. Um and uh yeah, the first ever 152 uh around Qatar. Broke Mark Marquez's all time lap record, I think from a couple of years prior. Um yep. and yeah, out of nowhere. First career pole position for Francisco Bagnaia. I wasn't quite able to hang on to it in the race, but still yeah. a very solid. Say in the third. race we uh in the race we we were looking at his pace like, is he saving tires when no? That's just what the Ducati had in it because it was mm. ripping its tires off the ribs. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but over a lap, still an absolute bazooka of a, of, of a, of a pike. I think the one that really got us going was the second qualifying session in Doha. Mm. The second time around, track wasn't quite as fast. There was a lot of sand in the area, a lot of high winds. It kind of wreaked havoc a little bit with the I mean, weekend. It was almost like it, it looked like the spray on a wet weekend, but sand. <laughs> Yeah, it was. You could see the That's sand kick off offline. the racing line. It was like we, we got a little bit of that during testing as well with with pet trucks when they pretty much had to cancel the day's running because it was unrideable um, out there. But we got Jorge Martin stealing a two. pole. It's like Jorge Martin's second ever race in MotoGP steals a pole position. Johan Zarco almost. Got him right back at the end, like 10 seconds later coming over the line. But Martin held on to it. Like, 
That was like that was an unbelievable lap from Jorge Martin. Where did he get that from? <laughs> oh, was he not the qualifying king of Moto Three once upon a time? Well, dug back yeah. into that bag. I mean, if there's one thing that we've associated with Jorge Martin over the years in his Grand Prix career, when he won the Moto Three title a couple of years ago, when he to, to a degree when he was in Moto Two as well. The one thing that would always stand about about well, stand out about Martin, I should say, is raw breakneck speed. Um, I said it on this very show a couple of years ago when he won that Moto Three title, and his main threat was Marco Bezzecchi. I said that might be the fastest, like for raw speed in terms of pace. I can't remember a guy being that quick out of the box since Mark Marquez, and I was just if, if it was unbelievable to watch um just some of the some of the um laps he was set in and the fact again he was one of those few people that can break away from a pack in a moto free race and that is already a skill that not that, many could do if you have uh, that you're in good shape if you're a moto oh three. buddy yeah <laughs> no kidding and uh this you, you know you've done something special when <laughs> Half the paddock gave him a stand innovation on the way back to the pits. There was high fives oh, yeah. down the there line. There was people running out of their garages to go congratulate him. It was a, it was a fantastic lap. Um, as you put it, Dre, just sheer one lap speed. Can I just say, I if, thought if it was real be funny that fast, as well. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just say, yes, I say, it was real funny as well that KTM was one of the teams that are out there giving him dap the team that rejected the chance to sign him. I just thought that was real funny. I was like, King, King, I'm, I'm looking in your direction here. <laughs> King's face we, right we, 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 oh we, we, Were you out there in that guitar back? Were, were, were you giving him dap? Was that it? I was like, yeah, well done, boy. No, I was, we didn't I was think hide, you were good I enough for us. The back. I was hiding in the back. <laughs> <laughs> My man was in the back in the orange gear saying, what have we done? <laughs> We, we kept the corner instead. <laughs> it's like the, it's like that one tweet that goes like, "She's just having a little sense, bro. She'll test you back. No worries." <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've been there. I think, I think uh, a lot of us have been there. Oh dear, the disappointments of life. But <laughs> Oh, thank God lockdown's ending soon. Anyway, <laughs> Martin <laughs> just... <laughs> Mar- Mar- Martin was just sensational. That was an unbelievable... I mean, that is a special club. I mean, you look at that club and you go... Guys who have had a pole position in their first, like, two races in the, in the MotoGP green. I can think of Jorge Lorenzo, who did it on debut. I can think of Casey Stoner, who I think did it in his second ever race and in all these another guy that anyway. just exudes raw speed yeah just like i remember stories back in the day of stoner setting his fastest sector times on his warm up laps that's just how fast he was <laughs> um on cold tires he was relentless um mark marquez did it in his second career race i think he still has the record for the young ever pole position in the top flight he does um and you know though if you're talking about that's a hell of a class. <laughs> yeah, Stoner, Lorenzo, and Mark Marquez, basically three of the last four best riders of the last twenty years. I mean, <laughs> three in terms of in terms of outright raw speed, three of the greatest of all time. <laughs> yeah, no, no ifs, no buts. Like Lorenzo, metronomic, Stoner, raw power, Marquez, biggest freak we've ever seen. I mean, that's. It's 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 ra- it's rarefied air to say the least to say the least. Um, yeah, I think he's got. I think Jorge Martin has a very bright future ahead of him in this class. Oh yeah, he, I mean, podium I second career that, race. <laughs> yeah. Prove that emphatically in the second weekend, and uh, again, victim of Ducati's tire wear, led most of the race. Uh, mm. Did give chase to Fabio late in the race when tried to stay with him, couldn't quite mm. do it. Uh, eventually got passed by Zarco very late on. Yeah. But kids, kids freak a bit good. Look, if, you're an only get, if you're only getting beaten by an, a freak talent they thought was going to be the French Marquez and Johan Zarco with a bit of veteran game at the end of a race where he passed him with three corners to go, like that was a mature, disciplined, didn't put a foot wrong, couldn't have asked for any more from Martin. And he was pretty much as humble as ever on the podium. He was like, yeah. 
This was this was about as good as he was going to get on the day, and that was that was look. The best compliment I can say is he did not look like a rookie out there. He looked like he'd been there five years already. That was a yep. that was a that was a perfect performance from Martin. Could not so, have I for think more. I think the big thing when he got into fights out out on track, he had the right mentality uh, in the second race. Mm. Can I just he, say he has great seems, race craft. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go on, does. Yeah, could I say as well? It felt like. This could have been a disaster weekend for Ducati, mm. but for Pramac, just by themselves, it could be seen as a success. And yeah, also, I was kind of, of thinking, man, I was, dis- I was disappointed that they couldn't close out one of those wins. And it's still one of the best double weekends that they've had in the sport. I think second and third is Pramac's best ever weekend in Grand Prix. I know, they've never, I know they've never won a Grand Prix, which I, I still find boggling with the talent they've had in the last half decade. Like, Pramac is still winless somehow. And it, was, it was only their second ever pole position. I um, mean, you've got to go back to Jack Miller in, a, in Argentina in 2018 for the other, the other Pramac pole position they've had in their top flight careers. But... Yeah, like I said, it was Pramac's best ever race result, second and third. They were 1-2 in qualifying. They're banging on the door. It will open They're eventually. Gonna, yeah, <laughs> yeah, with those two riders, at some point, watch him in Austria. Look. watch If, if we go to Austria, they have to be the favorites right now. I, I could sum it up in one sentence. Johan Zarco leads the world championship. How about that? A guy that was dead and buried a year and a half ago, who was looked at negatively for walking away from a certain team early. King, I'm sure you know which one. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a hint. King is now it wasn't about to, uh, um, King is now about <laughs> going to destroy his room and then paint all the rubble orange. <laughs> um, we thought it was dead and buried a year ago, and here he is leading the MotoGP World Championship with a pair of second places. I mean. Can't ask for much he's more. He's reclaimed than that. his own career. <laughs> he built yeah. something out of it. <laughs> now he's leading the championship. Sh- oh, shout out to Steven supporters general for saying, quotes, King's hovering over the big red button again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> King's going through it tonight. <laughs> you can't tell. He's, he's, he's smiling through the pain. Um, <laughs> can you get anything to say to that one, mate? <laughs> I am fine. I am. Really <laughs> <fine. laughs> That's a he's a good sport. Uh, speaking of the world championship and championship of, of implications going forward, mm. let me touch on our next point because uh, Big Red Honda, um, yeah, their whole season depends on a doctor's appointment. Pretty much next Monday from this recording. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's I believe is the twelfth. Yes, it is. Yep, 12th, 12th of April. On Monday. Because uh, Honda's, um, Honda's very special boy has a has a checkup. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if he only has, a, what is it, a 40-point gap to close. And he Could've is been worse. to come back. Oh, boy. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's on. Yeah, um, short recap of Honda's weekend. Paul Espargaro looked okay. Stefan Brattle looked mid. And LCR was a big bag of dicks. Uh, <laughs> both riders crashed in the first weekend. Alex Marquez crashed in the second weekend. I believe Taka rode home to a fringe points was, finish in race two. Uh, I want to say it was 17, but I don't think he even scored points. Uh, like, yeah, it, was, it was rough. Um, yeah. It, um, mm, it's just, just not good. Better than last yeah, year, 17th. but that's because it couldn't get much worse. Yeah, seventeenth for Taka, so no points at all for LCR off of both weekends. Double donut, double. Or say the double double donut. Um, we were high on them going into this season. Now, obviously, high. I know this is the first two weekends of the season, but that mm. that can't I mean, be good. This has never been a Honda track. Uh, even Mark Marquez's greatest efforts in his greatest seasons could not net him wins uh, mm. in 2018 and 2019 here. He tried his best. I, so I, going forward, I think they'll tick up a little bit. I think Paul, Paul had good speed, made a few mistakes in the second race. Mm. Uh, but yeah, their whole season depends on one doctor's appointment on April 12th and... If he's cleared to come back, oh boy. 
Who knows? Who knows? I mean, Lewis points out in our chat that Paul had probably top six level pace, but again, ran on at turn one once, made a couple of errors, not ideal. They're still getting to grips with that bike. And the problem is, it's hard to evaluate Honda at the moment because it has been all in on Mark Marquez. So, like, a part of you almost expects them to be, like, this far down. I mean, Paul had an okay set of pair of races. Yeah, Paul's, you know, were... Paul's pace was good. He's clearly yeah. still... He has adapted okay to the bike. His mm. speed is good. He's a little bit mistake-prone right now. My bigger concern is LCR because... Yeesh. It's a double-double donut. Yeah, the donut squared. The quad donut, as Jason puts it in our Discord server. Um, no, that's just like... the Audi logo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now, that was a quick pause for just a sec. But, yeah, we have. there's one more big incident that's worth talking about from Moto. Oh, TV, and that was in the second yeah. race. And I, this I was looked away and from this. I looked away from this one and then looked back and was just like, hey, did, did those two just bounce off each other? Did yeah, I see that um, ladies right? and gentlemen, friends of the non-binary, we do not condone. We do condone Fight, fight Club. We do not condone it at two hundred plus miles per hour on motorcycles. Not ideal. Um, now, for some, for a little bit, of, just to catch up, recap quickly what happened. This is probably a two-pronged incident. What happened was earlier on in the race, about half distance. Me, yeah, race two. Yeah, we'll point out. Thanks for that, Cam. Yeah, race two, about half distance through. Yoan Mir tries an audacious lunge at the left-handed hairpin towards the back end of the track on Jack Miller. He's not going to get there. He didn't get anywhere near enough of his bike alongside him to really, you know, cleanly pass him. There was contact. It pushed Miller off the line. Um, it was a dirty move by Mir, as we would call it. I wouldn't even call it a block pass like we would just say, like an end no, of the race. it was a bump and run. It was a bump and run. Miller luckily stayed on his bike. It was a bit of a nasty one. There was contact. Mir acknowledged it was dirt, a bit dirty because he, he dangled his leg off the end of the bike as he was coming through to basically... I think that was his way of saying sorry, basically. But he, of course he kept the place because he thought he's not that sorry. Um, oh, clearly. He's a, he's a racing rider. Yeah, it's like, but uh, he, he, he was, it was a, it was a dirty move from Mir. I think that's, I think that's fair for most parties to say it was a pretty yeah. dirty move. I don't think I'm anyone, uh, I don't think anyone would realistically call that move on. It no. was probably, I don't know if it was penalty worthy because both of them stayed on their bike, but at least nah. a look at by race direction, it, it wasn't good. Sure, riding sure. a now, fine line between uh, everybody makes it out okay, and that's a bold but. Very uh, inconsiderate pass, and we're playing bowling yeah. with uh, with motorcycles. Yeah, in this case, yeah. rubbing yeah, right is not here. racing. No, uh, no, <laughs> not on motorcycles. Never on motorcycles. Right now, about a lap later, it's the final corner of the track. Mir's gone too deep at the final corner. He's ran wide. He's on the edge of the outside curb. Um, on um, on that last corner on the run down to the start finish line. Miller, who's directly behind him, has taken the more conventional racing line. Me, obviously, the racing line of that corner, you end up near the outside curb anyway. Now, yeah. as Miller's gone through the exit, they they get they touch handlebar to handlebar, and uh, thankfully, they both stay upright. Um, that could well. have been catastrophic um a, li a little bit more of an accurate uh description of it miller got onto the straight starts passing near and then rides over towards him and they hit handlebars yeah it it it, it looked like miller probably did it on purpose i say probably there's some quotes we'll get to in a second but let's just say Mill like like miller was in his post race debrief he didn't exactly deny that he did it on purpose it was the i'm not going to confirm or deny these allegations i'm just going to let this shit ride um basically so i'm unaware of the allegations against me <laughs> yeah, they, they are certainly a thing. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it wasn't ideal. Race Direction looked at the incident. They deemed no further action. As we speak on, on April 7th, 
Suzuki are considering as to whether they want to appeal that lack of a penalty. Um, they're talking it over. Um, there were interviews after this race, and uh, I'll tell you for free, both men were incensed. <laughs> like, there was there was afters after the race finished with visors open, and you could see them on the main track. Actually, update from Lewis, by the way, Suzuki are not going to appeal that now, but I know they were oh, yeah. certainly considering it. They were thinking um, about it. They yeah, were thinking about it. It was yeah. it, a lot of it was more Mir himself and Mir's manager who was livid after the oh, race. Oh, big. He, was, he would not log off for any amount of money after the race. He was going me, off. I believe Mir's manager said on Twitter, and I quote, if I was if I said what I wanted to say about race direction, they'd take away my press pass. Um <laughs> <laughs> Which I think was the rough Look, Spanish well, translation. Um, not yeah. great. Um, there were some quotes after this. Um, shout out to Autosport for reporting on this. But uh, yeah. Um, Mir felt that Miller was intentionally clattered into him as he was well aware of where the Suzuki rider was and questions the decision by stewards not to penalise him. Quote, What happened with Jack is that in turn 10, it's the only place I could overtake and I took the right position, he said. Interesting. And then he decided to stay and then he decided to stay on the outside to maintain the line on the outside. We both touched a bit, then I picked up the bike. It was a maneuver that I understand was risky, but was not over the limit. Was okay. Quote, that is then a I moved... very very <laughs> racing rider. <laughs> Quote right on the line. Right on the line, I'll call that. <laughs> Quote Then I moved my leg to apologize because I couldn't avoid it. And then in the same lap, I was wide at the last corner, and when I came back, I saw Jack, and he was moving the head like he saw me. To be fair, this is true. Miller did look yeah, that's, over. Yeah, like, that's that's the bit that makes me think that it was 100% deliberate. Miller mm. looked to see where he was, and then turned. It was like a warning shot. I'll get, I'll get to that bit more detail in just a second. Um, quote, um, like... I just went to the curb, and he just came over me, and we both touched. We almost crashed on the straight, so I think it was super risky. It was a super dangerous maneuver. I think that was intentional. If you have time, compare the images of Alicia Spagaro, myself, and Miller and me. He ran wide at the last corner, and he saw me, and he stayed on the outside of the track, and I didn't hit him. I just respect the rivals. And I think that Jack didn't show respect in this case. It was the same thing, but different riders... So you can judge. Oh, um, when asked oh by Autosport if he thinks Miller deserves a penalty, he added, quote, Well, I think that the, the team will judge if they have to appeal to something. For sure, it, it has to be investigated because those moves in MotoGP are over the limit. Says Miller wouldn't be drawn into making too many comments about the incident, but feels the collisions he would have involved in were just the nature of the track and feels the penalty would have been wrong. Quote, I mean, there was few contacts, but, you know, it was the way the, the race was going. Seemed to be a bit of contact here and there, said Miller, who is considering going and going surgery for arm pump, which he has now done. He has had arm pump on the arm. It was just one of those things, I think. We've both seen what happened. Well, everyone saw what happened, and we continue to race after that, so not much really on, the, on that side of things. I got hit, I think, three times already before, so it seemed to be that that was the way the race was going. That's all, and I mean, if I was getting black flagged, then something was happening wrong, I feel. <sighs> that wasn't a denial. That wasn't a denial. <laughs> it's the he did it argument right here. You can't see if he has an audio, but I'm pointing fingers in both directions. It's it's, it's the Spider Man meme. It's just like, uh, like it, it. I the old, it's one of those racing deals uh, defenses. I just want to I, rattle his cage a little. I mean, honestly, I've got this is just this is where my opinion is on the matter. I was back and forth on this one. I wasn't sure. I think it's. Intent is a hard thing to prove at the better part of 200 miles an hour. Um, we've been here before in MotoGP about whether something may or may not have been <clears throat> I heard someone or not. over here wrote a book about it. Might have done. Um, but in the meantime, <laughs> I think I think the stewards probably did the right thing in letting it go because both men had their races compromised. By what they did on track. They both lost several seconds, several positions. But if 
I could also if understand. I yeah, you're gone. If I recall correctly, what Mir finished ahead of Miller, anyways, correct? Correct. I think self punishing, isn't it? I think I think karmic justice served itself on track on that one. Um, and to be fair, the stewards were very quick to investigate it and say no, let it go. Basically, I think it was within within a couple of minutes after announcing that they had investigated it, they'd said no further action. Um, I could understand. However, if they wanted to pull up Miller on that one and at least give him a long lap penalty, because I, if, if I was a steward and watching that, I would say double long lap penalty for Jack Miller and, you know, be worth about four or five seconds, because I think that was that Mears was on the line of what I think people would consider dirty. But it hmm. didn't really hurt anybody. Maybe just tell Mir to give the position back on the dashboard or something. Let me get in Formula One. Yeah. Yeah. And that would have probably been the end of the matter. Yeah, I know. That's fair. That's fair. What Miller did was potentially super dangerous. <laughs> it, I think, again, it comes back to intent. And if I had just seen it and he didn't look over... And he drifted over to Mir, I would have said. Very hard to prove. I think the fact that he looked over at Mir at speed and then moved towards him mm. says a lot about intent. Was it. Uh, I, uh, was it a case of retaliation? Did it. Uh, I think. Was it. Like, would this have happened if Mir didn't, you know, bump no. him off the road? No. I don't no, think it would have done. Absolutely not. And I don't think uh, I don't think retaliation, in this sense, has a place in in, motor, in motorcycle racing. Yeah, because we went dangerous. through a high profile case in that in a step below just a couple years ago, and that person and had to go down is, another step. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was thinking uh, I was thinking of the kick, not the handlebar grab. Good lord. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I mean. Differences, I mean, with Valentino's kick on Marquez, you know, that was going at relatively low speed into a corner. Mm. And that still garnered the penalty that it did. Granted, kick someone off a motorcycle. Mm. But uh, at these speeds, I don't think retaliation has a place. No, it's it's, it's like it's like what they it's what what any soccer coach will tell you. Don't be the second guy in the fight. Um, the second guy would always get the red card if a fight breaks out. More on that later. Um, <laughs> on on that one, but uh, yeah, a a very spicy incident there. And uh, personally, I think generally speaking, I think uh, Miller was a, a little bit lucky on 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 that one to avoid major harm. Uh, phew. Quick pause and yeah, let's. We got to talk about Moto Three now. Normally we would say, "Oh my god!" Normally we would save Moto Three for the end of the show, but we've bumped it up for one very special reason. Um, race one we had in Qatar was your stereotypical Moto Three season open in Barney, where you don't quite know everybody's at, everybody's feeling each other out, and Jao Masia came out on top. Like, like honestly, for a Moto Three race. Pretty bog standard. And by, by bog standard, I mean brilliant. But still, bog standard. <laughs> normal. Which is, which just, is weird just to say. Just a normal four-star match. Yeah, exactly. It's just <laughs> normal. Normal. Your, 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 your standard WWE 2008 main event. Point is, the second race in Doha was one where we thought, oh, this could be interesting because... We had a classic case of Moto3 dawdling on the racing line during free practice, and seven riders were given the penalty of a pit lane start. Well, stop me if you've heard this one before, but race direction really doesn't, really, really, really is trying to clamp down on this now. We've gone from grid positions to like 12 place grid penalties to back of the grid penalties, and now we're talking pit lane starts. I think they're just going to have to start sending riders home at this point. <laughs> it's getting it's getting close to that point, like really, um, and we'll, again more about that in a bit as well. Because looking at it, we had some heavy hitters in the pit lane. We had guys like Dennis Foggia, Romano Fanati, and Pedro Acosta, who had come second in that first race in, in Qatar on debut. 
Pedro Acosta just won a Grand Prix from the fucking pit lane. The f- the pit lane. He won from the. He won a race from the pit lane. Guys, help me out here. What the hell did we just witness? Uh, Dre, you're One of Dre, them. you're Dre, your your camera feed is very out of sync with your voice. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the internet doesn't right, like me very back. much. But I just, oh my god, I just the pit put lane. Perspective, the, the pit lane. He want uh, Lewis puts it into perspective in the chat. Pedro Acosta was eleven seconds off the lead at the end of the first lap of that race. That is nowhere in a Moto Three race. And That's in a, a Moto Three race, you have to remember. They they run it. This is pack racing. It's motorcycle pack racing. They're drafting. They're dragging each other along. In theory, if you fall that far back, it should be nigh on impossible to catch back up. You ever seen Mm. a a plate race at Talladega or Daytona? It's like that. You ever see the Peloton at a major cycling event? It's like that, but it's motorized. Yeah. And Acosta led the train of second runners up to the back of the leading group. He got there with about six laps to go. Um, there was a leading group of 19 runners in in, uh, in that lead. Just again, it, it basically was a cycling peloton. There was 19 dudes at the front of the field. Acosta got there. To be fair, so did Romano Fanati, but Acosta was just picking dudes off in the toe. Yeah, and then he, with had, about he caught them. Yeah. He cut through the field like a hot knife through butter. Yeah, and it's like, with, with about three laps to go, you realise, wait, that's Acosta! Like, what what the hell is he doing in the leading group? And he's and as they're going four wide into turn one, and it's like, what, how the hell is he here? Is he going to win this from pit lane? Um, and then, like, we got to the last two laps or so, it was really a leading group of about five by that point. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the true, okay, we've got another two, three tenths of pace dudes broke out, including guys like Darren Binder, for example. And that's what it ended up being. It was a one-on-one dogfight between Acosta yeah, and Costa, Binder. <laughs> Acosta got out in front of the pack and started to pull away. He tried to break the field with two laps to go. Yeah. After Binder. starting from the pit lane. <laughs> from the pit lane. Like... <laughs> Binder was the only man that could stay with him at that point in time. And Binder tried, and he lost out by a nose, but... He tried. He Pedro threw the house at him. Pedro Acosta won a race from pit lane. For extra perspective, this is a man who doesn't have a Wikipedia page. He is 16 years he has old one now. no Wikipedia page. He's 16 years old! It's his second ever world championship race. Am I correct in thinking that that had never happened before in any of the classes? It certainly hasn't happened in Moto3. It was the first ever Moto3 race won from pit lane. Special. (laughs) (laughs) He won from the pit lane as a (laughs) 16-year-old. Shout, so, 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 shout out to our man Lewis, who again was live tweeting this race. I think he now has carpal tunnel syndrome as a direct result. I of say, it. Uh, got um, the, he's got that new uh, <laughs> liquid cooled Ryzen powered keyboard. <laughs> and uh, he, a little quote from him in the chat saying, "Quote as they came round the last corner, uh, I shouted loud in the office, Darren, don't you fucking dare!" <laughs> um, <laughs> To be, I think that was yeah. all of us watching. Pretty much. It was like, don't you spoil this, Binder. You kind of caused a big <laughs> wreck earlier on in this race. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, 16 years old. He doesn't have his own Wikipedia page, despite winning the Red Bull Rookies Cup last year. Um, he has Trey. the red line on Wikipedia. <laughs> he didn't exist when Valentino Rossi was on a Honda. What? <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't even born! <laughs> oh my god. All the future he knew of is the world now. Was, all he knew of the world was Valentino Rossi and a Galosi's Yamaha. <laughs> 2004! Like, two and months he, after he, he was two months after he was born, Greece had just won the European Football Championships. And he has <laughs> no <laughs> cognitive memories of any of that shit. No, none! None! 
Like, yeah, as Lewis points out, no one had ever won a Moto3 race from pit lane. The closest we got to that was Brad Binder, who won from 35th on the grid. I think it was in Phillip Island um, in, back in his Moto3 days. And I thought that couldn't be topped. That, for me, we just watched was, it. That was the greatest Moto3 performance I have ever ever seen and there's been some special ones oh, that's it's awesome. one of the greatest performances i've ever seen on a motorcycle point blank mm. yeah it was a ref for pit lane as well by the way as a correction but yeah lewis was helping us out here saying last pit lane start in any class was marquez in germany 2014 and to be fair half the field started in the pit lane that day because it was uh changeable yeah, the conditions that, <laughs> that one had some mitigating circumstances but yes. you know <laughs> I, yeah, again, the only other time there have been changeable lane. conditions races. Yeah. Changeable conditions were the only other time this has happened, and never in a dry race, and never like this. That was. We witnessed history. We, no hyperbole. We witnessed history being made on a motorcycle. Unreal. Uh, like. Like, Jason, if you're listening, who organizes the M101 Awards, just cancel the nominations for individual ride of the year. It's over. <laughs> there, nothing is. It's gonna that. be really damn hard to top this. Forget it. Hey, forget hey. it. Is- <laughs> what if? Forget, forget it. What if? Click and house win the mod. I should kick <laughs> you from this <laughs> server. Uh, if that happens, I will cartwheel down my street in a pair of a, in a fong. I will cartwheel down my street <laughs> if that happens. This is no, right, someone get that in writing, everybody. Someone- <laughs> <laughs> yep, someone get that in writing. That is Dre <laughs> making his official Lama bet, as King has <laughs> bet that Alpine won't win or he'll take a blueberry pie to the face. Delicious. Anyone else yeah. want to get one in uh, real quick? But yeah, uh, um, in summary, a 16-year-old won a Moto3 race from the pit lane in his second start in a world championship event. <laughs> and it overshadowed an actual fight in the race. Yep. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to announce the return on Motorsport 101, because it's been a while since we had a proper one of these. Fight Club! Fight Club! Yeah, to be very clear, earlier, Mir versus Miller, not Fight Club. Too fast, boys. Too fast. This we had was kicks a... being... We had kicks. Oh, this, this, this was amazing. And to be fair... I don't know who got the footage, who leaked this on Reddit, but we got the helicam <laughs> shot that was cut away halfway during the actual broadcast. We have they ass in 4K. <laughs> oh, it was, it was beautiful. Now, for perspective, we had one of those occasions where Darren Binder had got a huge tow from about three bikes. He charged the front of the field. He kind of breaks a little bit late and cuts. I think it was Jeremy Alcoba. He cuts Alcoba up going yep. into turn one. Alcoba falls and his bike I can't remember if I'm saying this his bike literally hit John McPhee in the head yep. Um, yep. he took Sides a like muffler the to the back of the head uh, you, you was... took a whole ass motorcycle to the dome he yeah, took a um... bro pipe to the back of the nut. <laughs> yeah it was brutal both of them went down they collected each other um, it was a nasty one. Both guys were down. Thankfully, both were physically okay from the incident because uh, it was uh, it was a scary one um, in real time. But uh, <laughs> I love what Lewis put in the I, chat. I, I, oh I, I see what God. you put there. I'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But oh, it was beautiful. And then we see the like, if you see the helicam footage that again is on Reddit. If you really want to find it, um, as, I think it's on Twitter as well in certain places. Um, like, McPhee squares up to Al Cobra in a fit of rage, a bit of shoving, and he throws a kick. Now, I'm glad that bike light riders have started to learn that punching someone in the head is kind of redundant. Um, yeah, when you get a helmet, we need to bring this back one second. The big Mm. fatal flaw with, well, what was John McPhee thinking? He throws the kick. And then immediately turns around and walks away like that was gonna be it. What, like, what? What? You thought was, someone like, <laughs> nothing was gonna happen? Like, uh, yeah, has John like, McPhee never like watched mixed thinking. martial arts? <laughs> it's like he was thinking like, oh, if I walk away, he'll think someone else was kicking at him. <laughs> Look, you use <laughs> like, you dude. use the chick to the shin to to feel out distance before you charge in and go for a takedown attempt. 
Right, right. And it's like, it's, it's the kick's spot on. He throws the kick and then he just walks away thinking, you know what, I've atoned for, I've atoned for your sins. <laughs> I've kicked you. That's the end of the matter. It's fine. Of course, Jeremy Alcoba nope. didn't see it that way. <laughs> Chased him back and threw a couple of punches afterwards. Um, as, as, as one of the marshals, one of the marshals is in the, is exit the gravel trap trying to break them up and get them off the track because unfortunately boys, fighting boys, boys. on a live racetrack probably isn't a good idea <laughs> um <laughs> really um <laughs> and honestly you know what's funny about this as well well i'm about to uh announce because the sport did not smile kindly on this incident and understandably Ooh. fighting on a live racetrack is probably not a good look for no, anybody it's not, it's it's not a good look for the sport it's great for us it's Yo, great for us as degenerates. Oh, it is. But <laughs> Super if we're on a sport, this is like, oh no, this is throwing the sport in the dispute. Can't have this. Yeah. Trey, so, tell them what they hit him with. I call this the officially the Acosta Amendment because I think normally this would have been a pit lane start, but I think this is the first time we've ever had this penalty given out. A pit lane start for Portimao and... A five-second time penalty on the added time for Jeremy Alcoba and a 1,000 euro fine for his involvement in, I believe it was officially labelled as actions that were detrimental to the sport or something <laughs> along those lines, which is a really you know, like, fancy been. way of saying that you threw hands. Um, and McPhee <laughs> had the same penalty, but 10 seconds rather than five because he initiated the fight. Um, they may have so, put the sport into disrepute, but they put our content list into raptures. Beautiful <laughs> art. <laughs> Wonderful they just, scenes. They could have just waited uh, one more week and they could have settled this at WrestleMania. No. No. It's already no. a slapdash card enough as it is. Right. Right. Uh, look, we haven't got Bailey on the card. Let's have John McPhee and Jeremy Alcoba in a mufflers on a pole match. Who says no? <laughs> no? Might be a little uh, dangerous. <laughs> oh, dear. It, it was great entertainment. McPhee has gone on to apologize for um, yeah, for, apologize for his, his role in that. I was like, mate. His bike hit you in the head. To be honest, I can think of a thousand, like, less justifiable reasons to throw hands with somebody. Like, <laughs> like, because to be fair, if a bike hits me in the head and I'm still, like, of enough consciousness to uh, get off my bike and fight somebody, I can understand. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, John McPhee out here apologizing to everyone but Alcova. <laughs> also, but, but they're going to... To apologize I have to apologize for absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, you apologize to everybody but, but Alcoba, which was funny. And also, Lewis, you had, you had to tweet that out. Quote, Moto Free Rider John McPhee has been given a pit lane start 10 seconds after a normal pit lane start for the Portuguese Grand Prix and fined 1,000 euros for fighting with another rider. Quote from Lewis, and it's the best quote I've heard all night, the favorite tweet I've ever written on that account. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Lewis. Way to go, man. Keep, we love uh, you. <laughs> never change. <laughs> never change, buddy. Um, <laughs> Motorsport so 101 host privileges for life. Um, <laughs> but so uh, that was that, Moto3. Uh, that was Moto3. Now, Moto2. Is, is everybody Are you sure down? that's Sam Lowe's? Are we sure that's <laughs> Sam Lowe's under that helmet? Yeah. Are, is, are, are we sure there isn't... Are, are we sure there aren't, like... A Lowe's triplet out there that we just didn't hear of. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, Alex, this Sam, is... and of course, static noises. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Sam Lowe's oh. perfect on the season. Two wins, and, and both in actually pretty similar fashion. He took the lead early on, rode his race, and no one had the pace to touch him. Bit more, bit more hairy in race two because Remy Gardner was right on his muffler by the end of the race. But uh, it, it was a phenomenal. It wasn't. It was different in the sense of uh, the first. The other categories were just mayhem in their fights. Mm. This was a great tension race. Uh, he and Remy Gardner just were hitting each other with increasingly large steel chairs. Mm. So much so that uh, on the final lap of the race, they both set the fastest laps of the race. 
Mm. Oh, it was it was like that race I was at Bruno for MotoGP a couple of years ago when it was Dovi, Lorenzo, and Marquez, and they all set their personal bests on the final lap of the race. And I think it was Dovi in the front who had set the fastest lap of the Grand Prix coming over the line. Like it was it was a fantastic. Like, if you're the sort of person that likes a tactical race, this was wonderful to watch. It was just uh, mm. it was like it, you sit there and it, it's tense. You speculate, you think, has this guy got any tire left? Has that guy got any tire left? Is anybody saving something? Like, is, it was is fun Garner going to pull final, the trigger? Uh, mm. Yeah, in the final few laps, it was fun because every time one of them dropped a hammer, another one, the other dropped the other hammer. You oh, can yeah. go this fast? Well, I can go this fast. Mm. Mm. And, uh... A lot of fun. Yeah, Sam Lowe's is perfect on the year. Uh, Mom, come pick me up. I'm scared. Yep. <laughs> it's either things are going to go really great for Sam Lowe's the rest of the year, or there's a massive collapse coming that we just don't know about yet. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's coming. Uh, it, it was coming when you least expect it. It'll be like a, a bike will land on his wrist again somewhere in a random... Because, like, both there's going to be no in rem- between. Like... Both races are remarkably similar as well in that Lowe's had qualified on both races from pole. He'd also had crashes in both warm-up sessions on the night before the race had even started. <laughs> and he goes and wins both of them as well, including, again, they, the, 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 one of the fastest laps of the Grand Prix, his personal best on the final lap. Gardner set the fastest lap of the Grand Prix going over the line, but it just was not enough. Um... Again, if you like a tactical race, check it out. Um, both were fantastic. Um, and yeah, great to see Remy Gardner on a great machine fulfill some of the potential that, you know, it's, it's easier to go, ha, nepotism, look at his surname. But um, it's 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 great to see Remy Gardner he, up there, up the front. He is there on merit. He is not there because of his last name. And Indeed. I hope he continues to prove that for the rest of this year because he was he was the only guy who could hang on to Lowe's coattails. In that second weekend, pretty, pretty much the entire season so far, both races, and I've got to say as well, I, I said this to Ryan, who's become my, my brother, by the way. But I say, I say Ryan, I mean brother Ryan, not Ryan King. Um, <laughs> we, we get confused all the time in this server, um, but uh, he's he's also become like the world's biggest Remy Gardner fan, and I have no idea why. But I I warned him as the season was starting, you might want to watch out for the man's teammate. And um, the reason why I said it is because Raul Fernandez is fast as hell right out of the box. That is that is an alarming um, turn of pace from Fernandez. Who I thought is he going to drop off here in terms of like positions? Like no, he's he's he is he's walked into the class with top three level speed. That's insane. Yeah. Like yeah, in that second race. Um... For most of the race, we had a, a four bike breakaway. It was Lowe's, mm. Gardner, Fernandez, and uh, Marco Bezzecchi. Mm. And until last few laps, when Lowe's and Gardner really started going at it, Fernandez was all over his teammate Gardner. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's it, it points out like it's Lewis points out, and quite rightly so. Ayagura was fifth. In this second race at Doha, another rookie again was was top three in Moto in Moto three last season, and we joke I'm, about I'm the really Agura su- like we, we we joke about the Agura surprise last year during Moto three when he just come out of nowhere and all of a sudden oh my god Agura's in third, um and like this happened again happened Agura again. was fifth. It happened again. The Agura surprise. He finishes fifth. No one cared because Fernandez yeah. is just like bang. Um, Vietti yeah, was Agura, seventh. Uh, another rookie. <laughs> like yeah, good solid rookie class going into Moto Two this year. Uh, yeah, Agura got to the front of the the second pack behind the four the four bike breakaway at the front, but once those four got away, there was no real catching them, was there? You look, mm. you look at you look at that second race. You, you see Raúl Fernández third, Ayagura fifth, Celestino Vietti seventh, Tony Arbi, Arbolino eleventh, and amazingly, last year's Moto Three champion Albert Arenas only just got into the points in fifteenth. Um, hey. That is a hell just of a as rookie result. Predicted. <laughs> like <laughs> it's a little bit backwards, but like. If we again, we talked about this with Martin to a degree. Like, 
What was the one thing that stood out about Fernandez in Moto3 last year? Breakneck speed. Um, <laughs> it's becoming a theme here where just like if you have like in, uh, 80 grade pace, it's going to be realized these first mm-hmm. couple weekends. Well, if like I, I, King, you, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send some good news your way, King. Like I could, the Moto GP team hasn't worked out right now, but look at it this way: the Moto3 team, Masia, Acosta, Moto2 team, Gardner. Fernandez, they are You've got- absolutely <laughs> unstoppable everywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah, the riders <laughs> are not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm just yeah, saying. Um, there's reason, there's reason to be why- optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't touch on KTM in the MotoGP section because there wasn't much to touch on other than Miguel Mm. Oliveira having the single greatest start in the history of motorsport going from 12th to 3rd and then dropping like a stone. Finishing 15th. Yikes. um... (laughs) Uh, Moto2 and Moto3 looking real good for you. Yeah, like... Like as as Lewis points out, I completely agree. I said it on Twitter as well today, talking about it because I know Simon Patterson wrote, like, wrote um, a piece about like Lowe's is in a kind of tricky spot because he's thirty years old now. He's he's a veteran. He's somewhat of a known quantity in MotoGP. Not much given his time at Aprilia was, you know, we all knew Oof. it was rough yeah. to say the least. Um, mm, he was rough. Um, Team was rough. Bike was rough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, everything about it was bad. And, like, if Lowe's goes on and dominates and wins the championship, he's probably not going to get anything resembling a decent seat because he's 30 years old. He kind of, he's somewhat of a known quantity. And this sport has an obsession with chasing youth. The only exceptions we've really had in the last half decade were maybe Johan Zarco, who was a five-year veteran in Moto2, but won two championships, and had to wait yeah. for the Tech 3 seat to drop, and Tito Rabat, who was a guy who won a title, tried to win a second one, but was beaten by Zarco, and then had to settle for a not-so-good seat when he finally did come up. And again, these were guys who were mid-20s, four or five season veterans in the class. Alex Marquez, to I a lesser that. degree... Because he was a five-year vet in Moto2 as well, but he debuted mm. at 18. So it didn't matter so much. Yeah, that's that's um, the difference, is that, you know, with mm. Lowe's, it's tough to see someone taking a punt on him in, in MotoGP because it's taken him this long to come good, and even if he has come good, mm. and he's a viable rider going forward in GP, yeah, he's not a long-term investment like someone who is early 20s and already hanging on to his coattails. Yeah. I, and I said he on can Twitter, develop even further as a rider. <laughs> oh, the Jason at school said, could be worse, could be Marcel Schrotter, who we were all shocked oh. to find now. This is his 10th season in Moto2. I was like, what? what? <laughs> wow. We were just like, Moto2 class debut, 2011. I was like, fuck me. <laughs> I was just like, okay. Um, Decade-long veteran in the class. Still in the league. Um, but yeah, like I, I can't disagree with any of that. It's it's a it's a tough spot for Sam because I, I, if I was looking at the field right now and I've got a big board, like I'm an NFL GM or something, I'm circling Raul Fernandez's name about five yep. times in red ink saying... Sign this man, um, because uh, he looks fast as hell. Gardner got some name value there, finally coming good in Moto2, looking real solid. And again, you can look down the line. Marco Bezzecchi had rumors of Moto GP seats um, last year, specifically Aprilia, towards the end of his time there, was a title contender last season. You know, it's you're not looking so at much that like, Sam Lowe's mm. is... It's not so much that Sam Lowe's is bad by any stretch of the imagination now. It's the fact that you have a treasure trove of riders from ev- mm. almost every team up and down the Moto2 and Moto3 grids yeah. that you're going to circle because you can sign them, whether it's to your junior academy or if they're ready up to MotoGP, and you can build around them for the next decade at least. Hell, yeah. he's not even the Brit with the most upside. Jake Dixon's right there too. Yeah, yeah. Dixon and it's just, right there. Scope to improve. Lowe's has always fast. had the speed. He, he's mm. always had the speed, but if he had this 
if he had this ability to mitigate his mistakes two or three years ago, I think we'd be talking about a very different, uh, a very different future for Lowe's. Mm-hmm. Certainly so, and yeah, like like as, as Luke's pointed out, Jake Dixon being in the same category as him probably doesn't help. Who's, you know. Um, fast, also scope for improvement. He has done good things on a Moto2 bike in his career today and extremely charismatic if you listen to BT Sports coverage. They love a good Jake Dixon interview, and rightly so. He's a very entertaining young man, very funny, loves a good interview, genuine character in MotoGP in, in all three patterns, and there's not very many of them, to be honest with you. There's not many like Jake. He's a marketer's wet dream, um, quite frankly. So, you know, it's not an ideal it's... situation for Sam, but the best he can do is it's go dominate. We, yeah, it's the same problem we have w- that we talk about in Formula One and its junior categories. There's too many, there's too much talent and not enough rides in yeah. the top flight. The, especially now, given they're all going younger and everyone is looking for the next Marquez. They're not looking for solid riders to, to consolidate themselves. They want the next big thing on their roof. They've seen Marquez, they've seen Quattararo, they've seen Vinales. They've seen Mir. They want they want that guy. They want that guy they can build a team around for a decade, not the guy that might get you a few and good results for a couple of years. Yeah, and if you're only just getting into bike racing and you want a, an F1 equivalent, it's the same way. They're looking for the next Verstappen, the next Leclerc. That's that's yeah. where the mentality of these driver academies has to be. How, who because, are we I'm, building around for the next 10 to 15 years? And because the talent pool has now gotten so deep, it allows team bosses to be more aggressive in the talent that they can go out and go and select. We've seen it with Red Bull in, on four wheels. We've seen it with teams on two wheels now, where you've got to be sub-22 years old now. Like, like uh, uh, The best part in Patterson's post about this on the Redacted was the average age of a MotoGP rookie is now 23 in the last five years. 23. Like, that's... that's I'm 23. How cutthroat... Yeah. <laughs> I'm half a decade on 23. Like, that's just like... <laughs> it, My it, window it is shut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've had it, RJ. Like, go win two Moto2 titles and come back to me. Maybe we'll get you in. <laughs> like, <laughs> but uh, again, fascinating stuff. Um, again, also, quick extra note with a bit of news as well. Looking very much like Fabio Di Giantonio will be heading to MotoGP next year with Grassini. We just don't know what bike with yet. It could be a satellite Suzuki. Might still be an Aprilia. We've got to wait and see. Suzuki apparently are keen to have a couple, a couple of more bikes on the grid. They've got to talk to the big boys and see whether they can free up the money. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, As another... I, I would, uh, another sm- Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say like, like you know, maybe them being teams champion might be what convinces them to free up a bit more cash. Just, f- just throwing that out there. Hey, winning always helps the budget. Um, mm. Another small bullet point as well. You know, you touched on a little bit earlier. Jack Miller and Iker uh, Lecrona both had surgery to fix some arm pump issues. Indeed, they. If bo- you want to bo- know how that works, look it up because I don't want to explain it. Because it's kind of gross. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I explained it on a on a very early episode, and yeah, uh, it, it, it's not pretty. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not nice. um, Miller they they're both projected to be fit by the next race. Hopefully, even if they're not one hundred percent, they should be available to ride. Indeed, and one other really small note: get well soon, Top Rack Razgati Oglu. Turns out he caught COVID a couple of days ago, so it was, oh, it was a bit of a minor story for Wild Super Bikes. Get well soon, Top Rack. Hope, uh, hope he's not feeling it too rough over there on that one. We'll be, t- we'll, we'll, yeah. So yeah, uh, get we well like soon, ourselves Top Rack. On that some, one. Uh, we like he's ourselves fun. some rags on this show. We do. We, we all we, we love Raz, the Chaz, mm-hmm. Raz, and Baz show. Yes, indeed. Get well soon, Top Rack. Quick championship standings before we get out of town. MotoGP-wise, yes, you did read that correctly. Johan Zarco, world championship leader uh, with 40 <laughs> Holy points. Holy shit. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Ma- both the factory Yamahas, Maverick Vidales and Carlos <laughs> on 36. King, if you want to you break out them... Like, King, if you want to break out Lamar Cies at any point, feel free. You know, by, by all means. If you want to stand up, maybe give a salute. 
knock yourself out. I don't mind if I run these down. Francisco Bagnaia on think, 26. And I, th- on 23. I, think that, I think that salute's going to involve a single finger. <laughs> really? Uh-huh. And, and a uh. button being pushed. Uh, Moto 2, Sam Lowe's, that's 50 points. Remy Gardner with 40. Ralph Fernandez on 27. Bez with 26. And DJ Antonio with 22. And in Moto 3, yes, that is a 16 year old child leading the championship. Pedro Acosta with 45 <laughs> points. I still I'm can't not believe. Old. Can I'm somebody not write old. that on Wikipedia page? <laughs> like honestly, get somebody needs to get on that. Um, Pedro Acosta forty five points, Darren Binder thirty six, John Messia thirty two, Nicola Antonetti, yes, remember him on twenty six, oh and God. the other really talented youngster we thought might be up there early on, Isan Guevara on nineteen in fifth. MotoGP will be back in a week and a half's time at Portimao. Maybe with Mark Marquez, maybe not with Mark Marquez. We'll, we'll, we'll know on Monday. As a recording, that will be April 12th. Keep an eye out on the timeline because uh, that may make or break not only Honda's season, but everyone's season in the top flight. There'll be a lot of riders eagerly on their laptops waiting for the news on that one on April 12th, most definitely. But uh, we'll be back for that in couple of weeks time it's gonna, be, means, it's gonna be a good weekend yeah indeed good good weekend yeah. indeed that well, and if, formula one at if you as didn't well. already watch bikes it's that good go watch bikes all three good. classes that good yeah go watch do, it can't wait for more it. you can't wait do for it more. it was f- do it. It'll, it'll be fantastic. Um, yeah, busy weekend. That a uh, triple header of uh, Formula One at Imola, MotoGP at Portimao, and IndyCar season debut as well um, in St. Petersburg. So that's going to be uh, all over the shop. Um, busy, busy, busy triple header weekend. Um, yeah, on that we love one. ourselves so, some IndyCar in this corner. We indeed season preview for that will be next week. By the way, alongside a Formula E pre- uh, review of the double header in Rome. So that will be uh, very fun to check out as well looking forward to that um basically you can find us one more time before we get out of here we're on youtube.com forward slash motorsport 101 subscribe hit the bell if you haven't already if you're watching us on youtube hi thanks for watching again feel free to like the video subscribe all of that good stuff facebook.com forward slash motorsport 101 twitter and motorsport underscore 101 our handles are on screen at harrison 101 hd at rj o'connell at ryan eric king and at c buckley 917 we're on instagram at motorsport 101 pod um and uh, we are also on patreon if you'd like to back us financially on there patreon.com forward slash motorsport 101 five dollars for early access to all the audio versions of our show 10 bucks for the video version and the supporters top of our discord server uh shout out i didn't make it to start shout out to zale to steve to jason to lewis for being the goat as always to sasha to vic and zoe um thanks everyone for tuning in hope you guys enjoyed it uh we'll be back next week for a double header uh, two episodes like i said formula e in rome and our indycar season preview um until then i've been dre harrison They've been RJ O'Connell, Ryan Eric King, who uh, and Cam Buckley will be back next week. Until then, go watch bikes and it's sad. <laughs> Sayonara, y'all. Take care. Later, y'all. Bye. God, I love motorcycle racing. Obey nothing. Defy everything. <laughs> next week on the podcast. <laughs> And he goes for an eighth pancake on the stack.